Hi, I'm Laura Stewart, the program coordinator at the Salt Marsh. I'd like to welcome you all to come out on a beautiful day on Nantucket. This is great. The Arth best. The best. Arthur is here. He is a lawyer. He's been here many times Can before. Can you tell I look like a, law a lawyer? <laughs> I thought it was a joke downtown. I'm the only suit right. walking around downtown. Exactly. So right. true. Today he is going to he's came to talk about wills, trusts, powers of attorney, keeping control health, as you slow keeping down. Keeping control as you slow down. So with no further ado. Laura, thank you very very much well. and thank you uh, to the to the folks here at the at the senior center. It's really been nice of you to invite me. I think this is like our third year or fourth year here. Uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I uh, do nothing but elder law. I, I, I'm in a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us. So there's somebody there that does everything. And fortunately, that means that I don't have to think about anything else except this. Um, so I've done a lot of presentations here before on a variety of issues, many of them kind of very specific. So what I decided to do this year is I, we, I do four presentations here a year, two in the spring and two in the fall. And I decided for my spring presentations, I would focus on the kind of general things that you all have to know, right? Uh, now, as a result, I can't go into depth about some of those because there's a lot you have to know as a person who is, say, over 65. And then in the fall, I'll be doing more specific programs. The reason why I mention that is I haven't picked those yet. So if there are particular specific programs that you'd like to know about, I'd like to know about that from you so that I can kind of figure out what I want to do for the fall. So uh, Elder Law 101, which is today, and I'm sorry, by the way, that they canceled the boat the last time, which is why I wasn't here a month ago, right? It was, it was nothing better than driving from Worcester <laughs> to, arri to arrive after an hour and a half, a half an hour before the boat's going to leave. And they say, oh, in five more minutes, we'll tell you if the boat's going. I'm like, what? Right? And of course, it didn't. So I got to drive back to Worcester. That was a great day. Um, but today's pretty wonderful. So Elder Law 101 <clears throat> is about... The things that you should know when you are slowing down, when you are probably retired, so maybe your income from work is not no longer going up, uh, and you're and you, but you're still feeling good, right? You know, you're not like really, really sick. You're not worried about those things, but you want it. But you know that in the future these things could come because you have now come to realize um, that you're going to die because you're older, right? As I always tell people, one of the nice things about doing elder law is that all my clients know they're going to die. You know, their kids don't, and they don't think you are, and that's why when you bring it up, they don't want to talk about it, you know, but you know. And, then, and also, for most folks have kind of reconciled to that. It's like, okay, I get that, I'm going to die. And, and, you know, you're not happy about that, but it isn't nearly as scary, ironically, as, as living with a lot of frailty, living with dementia, living with, dealing with cancer, dealing with that, that kind of slowing down. So you're kind of worried about all that stuff, right? But in the meantime, the question is kind of what do you have to do? And the first question that oftentimes people will, and by the way, I'm going to talk about my friends here, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. If you've been here before, you've, you've, you know about them. And, and if you're old enough, you actually get that joke. You know, the younger people, they don't, they, they what? You know, so Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. have, or Frank and Mary have very simple goals. They want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Uh, it, all things being equal, when one of them dies, they'd like to leave everything to the other. When the two of them die, they want to leave everything to their kids. In most places, that means they want everything sold and the proceeds distributed. In Nantucket, it often means, how are we going to save the house? So that's a kind of a whole separate issue. Uh, which I actually do a presentation called Cottage Law, which is how to figure out how to save the house. But that's not the issue for today. The question for today is, and Frank and Mary's assets, well, obviously, they don't own a house in Martha's, in, 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 in uh, Nantucket here, right? This is a, this is a kind of mainland figure. Um, but they own a house, and we're going to talk about, because their house value is lower, low enough, they don't have estate tax issues, but we're going to talk a little bit about estate tax issues because I bet a lot of you folks do worry about that because of the price, the value of your house. Um, they have an IRA. He's got an IRA with $150,000. They're not, you know, well off, but they've got an annuity, $100,000. They've got some cash. They've got a total assets of $625,000. He's got he's collecting Social Security of $1,500 and a pension of five every month, and she's collecting half of his pension amount or $750. So they're going to be okay. They can pay all of their bills. Um, but they want to make sure that they're, like, prepared, right? Because they want to live in their house till they die. They don't want to go broke before they die. 
They'd like to think that after they die, there was something for them to leave to their children. Now, one of the first questions that these people will ask me when they come in to talk to me is they'll say, you know, I really need a will, don't I? And my immediate response to them, it's actually, well, you know, if you're Frank and Mary and this is your situation, you actually don't. You don't. Because what I just described, the situation where when one spouse dies, the other spouse gets everything, and when the two spouses have died, everything goes to the children, that's exactly what happens in the probate system uh, if you don't have a will, unless there was a previous divorce, in which case you do need a will for, to deal because you, that, that distribution system is different, right? But in Frank and Mary's situation, they don't need that unless there's something unusual about their situation. And the two things that I tell them that might be unusual is if Peter or Paul or Mary Jr. either have marital problems or creditor problems or a disability. Because if you have marital problems, well, you know, you really don't want to leave a third of your assets to the daughter-in-law you never liked anyway, you know, or the son-in-law, right? And if you leave it to your child, and then the child gets a divorce, that money could be in play, right? Um, you don't want to leave it to their creditors. You know, if you've got the one child, which I always think of, they inevitably I get them described as the free spirit in the family or the poet. Um, often they are the ones that have got creditor issues also. And you don't want to inadvertently leave your money to their creditors, right? Or you may have a child who has a disability. Um, and who therefore may already be on mass health or other government programs that are means tested or may need to qualify in the future and you don't want to inadvertently leave them money thereby making them ineligible for the government programs which would be crazy. In all of those cases you'd want to have a will or something in which you're leaving that chunk of money to somebody in trust for them. Right? Often simply in trust naming one of your other kids as the trustee, the manager of the money for their benefit. Typically as soon as they've touched the money, they can't give it back or put it into trust and protect it against those three groups, the spouse, the creditors, or the state. But if you do it as a, as a you, and you're creating thereby something called a third party trust where you're funding it, the legal theory is because you didn't have to give them the money in the first place, if you put rules on how they can use the money, that's totally up to you and nobody can overrule that. No court can overrule that. So that's wills. The documents though that you absolutely have to have <clears throat> are a healthcare proxy, a molt, you should do a MOLST and a power of attorney. Raise your hand. Anybody here know what a MOLST form is? M-O-L-S-T? Ah, okay, we're gonna talk about, so MOLST, well maybe I'll start there then. So a MOLST form uh, is meant to replace the traditional DNR. Well, heard of the DNR, the do not resuscitate form. Oh, often and, big, and, and uh, euphemistically called the comfort care form. I never got why they called it the comfort care form, right? Was the form that was signed that said, if my heart has stopped beating, don't try to start it again, right? That's, that's artificial, re that's resuscitation, CPR. Don't try to start it again. And, and what, the, what the Department of Public Health is, is trying to do is get rid of that. Right? And by the way, something about that form and also about the most form is that it really is not an instruction from you to the healthcare providers that says don't do these things. It's really an instruction from your doctor. So the important person to sign that form is actually not you. You often sign, will, will sign an assent, but it's your doctor. Because basically, this is a doctor's order to everybody down the food chain, the, the nurses and the EMTs and everybody else saying, it's okay to not try to resuscitate that person, right? right? You're not gonna get in trouble by not resuscitating that person. So that's why it's the key is the doctor. Now the most form itself, so with that said, I'm gonna talk about the most form a little bit more in a few minutes. Healthcare proxies. So the point of the proxy uh, is uh, um, so-called living wills or advanced directives in, 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 whereby you say, well, you know, if I'm you know, feeling like this, I don't want you to use any artificial means and blah, blah, blah. None of that's enforceable in Massachusetts. So, living wills are not enforceable in Massachusetts. Um, it, there was an attempt to make them enforceable back in the 90s, got opposed by a number of groups, including the major one was the Catholic Church, um, based on the grounds they didn't want people to be trying to predict in the future what their situation was um, without kind of really knowing. So instead, of doing that, the legislature created the health care proxy and basically said, you, through your execution of the health care proxy, can name someone who, 
if the, your doctor has said in writing you are incapacitated, you can't make a medical decision, you may be fine in terms of being able to do some other things, but you can't make a medical decision. In that case, the proxy makes it for you. So the doctor actually gets to talk to the proxy instead of you, right? So a couple things about that proxy. You need two witnesses. You know, it doesn't have to be notarized, just has to be two witnesses. Um, the person have, holding the proxy can make medical decisions. That's the only thing you're empowering them to do. Um, this, my, I, a lot of my clients um, either are, among other things, worried about Alzheimer's or they have Alzheimer's or they know somebody who does. So the question sometimes come up, comes up when someone's signing one of these, could my kids put me into a nursing home if I signed this and I didn't want to go, right? And the answer actually is no. No, they can't. Um, there is actually case law in Massachusetts that says that if, if you get brought to the nursing home because your kids are thinking you're really kind of losing your grip and, and you get to the nursing home and you say, I don't want to stay here, the nursing home isn't supposed to take you, right, without a court order. Um, the court, the decision on this, basically the ruling was that by saying you didn't want to be at the nursing home, you were revoking your proxy which you certainly were in that case, and you retain the right to revoke your proxy at any time, even if you're not capable of making medical decisions. So I, I, in, this, in a particular scene, imagine you're in the, the hospital room uh, with your daughter who is your proxy and your, and, and your doctor, and your doctor has said you, you're not competent to make decisions, and the doctor says, uh, I think we ought to operate. And you say, oh, I don't want you to operate. And your daughter says, well, uh, yes, I agree. I think we ought to operate. You can say, you cannot right then overrule your daughter, but what you can say is, she's fired. I don't want her to be my proxy anymore. Even though you're crazy. Even though, you know, and the theory was, that the theory behind the law was, in those kinds of decisions, you always wanted to err in favor of the older person whose rights were really being taken away through the proxy law, right? So, by the way, the flip side of that, that, that what I just explained, obviously, a lot of people will say, but you mean, you know, if my, my wife's really lost it, I really can't bring her to the nursing home if she doesn't want? And the answer is, that's correct. You can't. Um, some nursing homes will still, will still take people, but they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. You have the right to, 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 to terminate, to, to not go in. Um, who should be the proxy? Inevitably, when a couple comes in, they'll name each other as the proxy, and then they'll name maybe one of their kids as the alternate. And, and that makes perfect sense in most cases. But as you get older, right, ask yourself, if, you, if your spouse were in the hospital, it was a medical emergency, and you've got a designated child who can ha you feel can handle this, Peter Paul or Mary Jr. is kind of around and can handle this, what do you want to be doing? Do you want to be with your wife at her bedside? Or do you want to be reading the medical forms and trying to figure out what, what the heck all that stuff means, right? So you may decide if you have a child or somebody that you feel comfortable with that you don't want to be your spouse's proxy because you know they're going to consult you, whoever it is, right? And that way you don't have to think about it. Um, you, there are, as I had mentioned, the, any instructions that you put, even if you put instructions in your medical, in your proxy, your healthcare proxy, they're not legally binding. They're totally just advice and they just have the effect of confusing the doctor. So my general recommendation is when you're doing one of these proxies, don't put any other wishes in that document, which is going to go to the doctor, who's not a lawyer. So he's going to see all this other stuff about how you want to be taken care of, and he's going to say, I wonder if that's binding. That's the last thing you want your doctor to be thinking about when he's in the room, is whether he needs to call his lawyer, right, to figure out something. So don't put that stuff in. If you've got particular instructions, put it in a separate document, Give it to your child if he's going to be the proxy. A lot of times what's handy about that document is while it's not binding, it takes the child off the hook in terms of the other kids, you know? Like, I think we should keep Ma on the machine. Yeah, but Ma said she didn't want to be on the machine. You know, that's what the document says, you know? So it might help them that way, but it's not legally binding. And, and what, in, regarding what you're going to put in that, you know, the standard language that you always hear about, you know, you folks, I bet many of you remember the Terry Schiavo case from not that many years ago when the, the, the wife was on the machine and the husband wanted to, to unplug her and the parents didn't and there was all that fighting. And the reason for all that fighting was there was, you know, that there was no healthcare proxy. Nobody had been named to make the decision, right? 
But in that case, the, the most common case that I hear is people will say, well, I don't want to be on all those machines. If I'm just going to be a vegetable, take me off the machines, right? And that's fine, except what is a vegetative state exactly? How sick do you have to be before you're saying, take me off the machine? Wouldn't you rather that your, that your child kind of help figure that out based on kind of what's going on? There's another common one that was in there that really upsets me. I see often that there'll be a provision that says, I don't want any extraordinary measures taken uh, if I cannot recognize other people and, and co conduct basically coherent conversations. Well, you know, I deal with a lot of people with dementia, a lot. I used to think that dementia was, or that Alzheimer's, that there were a set of, 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 of symptoms of Alzheimer's and that they always went with Alzheimer's. There was like losing your memory, you know, obviously, so, and all the implications that have. So you kind of eventually can't brush your teeth because you can't figure out how to do it, you know, and you can't remember exactly who your wife's name is, except at least not all days, you know. And then there are these other things like anxiety and depression and anger and all these other things. I used to think those were all the same. They were all inevitable symptoms of Alzheimer's, but from dealing with a lot of Alzheimer's professionals, I don't believe that anymore. I think a lot of those other things are really people's reaction to the fact they can't remember, and they're angry about it with themselves, and they're frustrated, and people's reactions to other people dealing with them. Like, I know I can't remember your name. Why do you keep telling me that, you know, I can't remember your name. So I think you can, I really believe you can live a happy remainder of your life, even with fairly advanced dementia. So when you're doing this kind of list of wishes, do you really want to tell your proxy, if I can't remember your name anymore, unplug me. Don't give me any drugs, you know. I mean, you may be very happy for a few years, even though you can't remember her name, you know. So you know, come, we want to think about that. And in that list of instructions, think about other stuff you might want. Do you want someone to call a priest? or things that your kids would never think to do, right? Or a rabbi, you know, or some, you know, somebody, you want to think about those things. So, um, organ donations. While we're on this topic, um, organ donation. I, I, I would bet that many of you would assume that the only time that organs or parts of your body are going to get donated to anyone following your death is if you signed up for it. You know that thing, you do the thing with the registry of motor vehicles and blah, 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 right? Well, that used to be the case <clears throat> until about two years ago when, actually three years ago now, when the law got changed because they weren't getting enough donations. And so the New England Organ Bank, which is the entity to which your body gets sent so that they can take the pieces before they return it to the funeral home or whatever, um, lobbied heavily. And now the law says that it is presumed that it is okay for you to give parts of your body to the New England Organ Bank um, unless you have said otherwise, right? Now, I explained this at a seminar here last fall. No, was it last fall or last spring? Last fall. And a woman who was here today came up to me afterwards and said, I don't want any of my parts to be donated. What do I do? Isn't there like a form or something that I can sign? You know? And after much delay, this is incompetence on the lawyer's part, I finally said, I should contact, I don't know the answer to this. So I called, contacted the New England Organ Bank and I said, so is there a form you can sign if you don't want your body parts given? And they said, no, <laughs> there isn't actually, um, which is kind of unfortunate. So that what you want to do in this case, right, is you want to put it in your healthcare proxy. The reason for that is that for all other purposes other than this, when you die, your body is under the control of the personal representative under your will, formerly called the executor or the executrix, if he or she decide, or is willing to take control of the body otherwise the, the spouse or the next of kin. But for purposes of organ donations only, the proxy is in charge of your remains. So my suggestion would be put something, if you don't want to go, if you don't want your body chopped up, you know, or used, um, and, and, and I know that this specifically concerns uh, Orcs, Orthodox Christians and Orthodox Jews or conservative Jews for religious purposes, then the place where you want to put that information is in your health care proxy, interestingly. You're like, who knew? Whoever would have guessed that? Now, going back to the MOLST form. Um, the MOLST form covers, as I mentioned, a whole bunch of things, and we're going to talk about a few of them. But the main thing is, um, first of all, it requires a doctor's signature. Uh, as well as yours. And secondly, the question is, well, where do you put it? Because, you know, th this is most commonly used when there's a big emergency. The EMT just came through the door, you're on the floor, what do we do? 
The answer is on the refrigerator. Why is that? Because that's the only place the EMT is going to look. Uh, I do these TV shows called Bergeron Briefs. I've done a, a few here. In, in, in one of them, I interview the person who runs this kind of large ambulance service in Central Mass, and he brought in his head of operations. And they said that. They said what they train all their people to do is if you've got an emergency, you go in the house and you see the body there, you look at the refrigerator. There's no form on the refrigerator. That's the last place you're looking because you're busy. You know, you've got to deal with someone who's on the floor, and you're, it's a matter of seconds, right? So if you're concerned about this when you're at home, that's where you put the form. Now, the form, the decisions. The most form includes the old, you know, do you want to be resuscitated? Now, what does that mean? It means your heart has stopped. Do you want someone to try to start it, right? Now, to start your heart again when it has stopped, somebody has to press on your heart really hard and press it kind of up and down so that it will start again. To do that, they have to push through your ribs. And if you're an old person, that means they're probably going to break all your ribs trying to push down on this heart. So if this doesn't work, right, then what you've really decided by saying that you, that you want CPR is you've decided that you're going to die in an incredibly painful way because there's going to be all of this pain that's going to be for no special reason. Now, with that in mind, you should know that if you are over... I think that I, I did this presentation with a gerontologist, a one, wonderful woman whom I should bring out here sometime. And, and she said, she just read a report that said if you are over, I think she said if you're over 70, your likelihood of, of living more than 30 days if you have CPR and you've gotten resuscitated is 5%. Right? So you, the, 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 your likelihood of it actually succeeding at the time they're doing it is like 25%. So... You just want to keep those things in mind when you're making that decision. So it is an important decision, right? Because it, it, it's your body. It's your body. And you want to decide whether, you've, whether you want that kind of pain inflicted on your body. Um, intubation. Well, what is that? that is, that's sticking a tube down your throat into your lungs because the goal of it is your lungs have stopped breathing. And somebody wants to start pushing air into your lungs and sucking it back out artificially so they can kind of get your lungs to start breathing again. Also, not a good time, not a pleasant experience, right? So you just want to decide whether there are circumstances in which uh, you don't want that to be happening. Um, and by the way, all, all of these decisions, no matter what you've said on, in the most form, uh, can be overruled by your healthcare proxy on the spot, no matter what, your pro no matter what you've said. If the proxy says we want them intubated, they're going to be intubated. Whatever the proxy says rules. So the proxy is very important. Um, finally, I think to me this is the most important thing that's on the most form. Do not hospitalize. If your goal, like that of Frank and Mary, is to die at home, then do you want to go to the hospital if, you've, if, if, you know, if, you're, really, if you're otherwise not well and this happens? Do you really want to go? Because I'll tell you, if you go to the hospital, they will keep you alive, right? Because the doctors are not trained to let people die. To them, to most doctors, they haven't kind of gotten the message on this that that's not a bad thing, that dying at certain points is not a bad thing. And by the way, um, in parenthetically, I'm gonna recommend for all of you who are here and anyone you know who is over 65, read this book, Being Mortal, Being Mortal, by a guy named Atul Gawande, A-T-U-L, Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E. He was, his dad was an Indian surgeon who moved here. This guy was raised here and became a surgeon. He's now a surgeon at um, Brigham and Women's and teaches at the Harvard Medical School and just wrote this book after his father died and going, kind of going through. But it's a wonderful, have wonderful sections on it, on dealing with Alzheimer's and on what the possibilities are for, for, the, that kind, for, for nursing homes and stuff, and wonderful chapters on this, on dealing with cancer and frailty and how you try to balance these issues out so that you can try to make sure your life every day is a good day and that you're not just, just trying to extend the number of days even though they're really terrible days. So I would really recommend that you, that you read that book. Now, the reason why you want, I'm gonna to answer all questions at the end. Oh, oh, Being Mortal, Being Mortal, just came out. It was a bestseller. There was also a, um, uh, it, the, he, they did a, the NPR, yeah, the NPR is 60 Minutes. I think it was NPR did a big show on him in, I want to say in January. 
I think it was in January, and so you can, I'm sure you can pick it up on YouTube. Just terrific. The alternative to this healthcare proxy, if someone needs to make a medical decision for you, that's it, guardianship. Someone's gonna, someone, some lucky person's gonna have to go to the probate court, which of course there are never many judges here, right? Because the way they have, you know, the, the, oh, if the, the boat isn't running, you can't get a decision, you know? So you're gonna go to probate court, you're gonna spend about a month and a half, they're gonna spend about $10,000 in attorney's fees. That's if everybody's in a good mood and not fighting over this, right? And if you get any kind of dysfunction in your family, this is the way that, this is a public airing of that dysfunction as kids of yours fight over who's gonna be the guardian. It's just terrible, right? You avoid all of that by simply doing the healthcare proxy. Powers of attorney. Does the power of attorney need to be notarized? Well, no. Does it need to be witnessed? Well, no. The only time it has to be notarized is if there's a provision in it that gives the attorney the ability to sign deeds or other real estate documents. Otherwise, it doesn't have to be. So should it be notarized? Yes. Why? Because, and, and by the way, I've been here so many times that people get bored by my jokes, but you've heard this. My, my daughter, who is, by the way, now a lawyer, appeared before the United States Supreme Court a month ago. This is the proud dad talking, talking here. Um, when she was in high school, gave me a t-shirt. The good lawyer knows the law. The great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in this case, the person who is the judge is not a judge. The person who is trying to decide whether to accept this power of attorney is like the bank teller, right? You know, I hear you've got your power of attorney from your dad and you want to sign checks on his behalf. And the bank teller looks at the document and says, I don't think this is a, official, <laughs> you know? So, and, 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 and what are you going to say? If he says, well, what, you know, talk to the supervisor. What if the supervisor doesn't think it's official? You're going to sue him? You know, it, so you need a document that looks official. It has been my experience after almost 40 years of practicing law that nothing makes it look more official than a notary seal. It has no significance, except that it makes it look official. So um, if the power of attorney, if you're going to allow the person that you're naming to, to give things away, give some of your things away on your behalf, and to give them specifically to themselves, in either case, you, that needs to be specified in the power of attorney. That's very important. We're gonna mention this later on when it comes to dealing with if there's an emergency and you've got to do some asset shifting for mass health purposes. Uh, and finally, you, as opposed to the, the proxy, which you have to name one person at a time, for, health, for powers of attorney, you can name people jointly and severally, which means you can name two or more people and they all have to sign off. That's if you're really paranoid, right? Or you can name two people jointly and severally, which means either one of them can sign at any time. So that you avoid, going back to my bank teller person, the, 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 you know, the husband's made the wife as the primary proxy and then the daughter as the, as the alternate, right? If the primary isn't, isn't, is incapacitated. So now the daughter goes into the bank and says, you know, I want to sign my dad's checks. But the power of attorney says, you know, your mother is the attorney. Yeah, but she's not well. Well, how do I know that, says the bank teller. A good point. He doesn't, right? So it's a lot easier if they're simply both named. It just makes it easy. It's more convenient. Uh, the, alt, the alternative to having a power of attorney, if you can't sign your own things, someone has to go to that same probate court, spend another $10,000, whole separate process, to become named the conservator. Once again, brings out fighting and it's awful. You don't want to do that. Now, a little bit about asset protection. Another one of the questions that people regularly come into me with every week, every week, is they've heard that Frank and Mary, that they've got to, if they, that if they're nervous about nursing home care. They know that the costs are tremendous, right? Nantucket happens to have one of the most expensive nursing homes in the state um, uh, um, for various reasons, which I won't go into, but it just, it just does, you know, but, but that's not an uncommon number. Here, the cost is about $400 a day, so it's about $12,000 a month. Do the math, that's almost $150,000 a year, so people worry about it. Um, so they'll say, oh, I heard in the radio, I heard in the radio or so on TV, yeah, what I have to do is I have to give away my assets, I have to wait five years, because there's this five-year look-back period. Well, if you're Frank and Mary, that does not apply to you. Let me explain why. Remember, those are Frank and Mary's assets. I'm going to have to do this part first before I can talk about kind of the planning piece. So if, if, if those are their assets, so they get a total of $625,000 in assets, how many of you think that if Mary went into the nursing home because she wasn't feeling well, that, that they'd need to be on private pay and spend down some of these assets before they could qualify for mass health. Anybody think they would need to spend any odds oh, because you've been here before? Because um, the answer is no, you don't. 
Uh, and the reason for that is that while Mary, in order to Mary will want to qualify for Mass Health, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. The reason for that is that while she has Medicare, as does Frank, Medicare is health insurance for the sick. It pays the cost of getting better, and it pays co the cost of skilled care to get you better. It doesn't pay for the cost of staying the same. And, it, and the benefit in, in, in operational terms is it, it, it gives you up to 100 days of nursing home care if you have been admitted to a hospital for at least three days and if you're in the nursing home for the purpose of getting better and your nursing home is certifying to Medicare that that's the case, that the things that are being given to you, physical therapy, nursing, blah, 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 are all skilled services needed to get better. Otherwise, you're there on private pay. By the way, the average Medicare paid uh, period in a nursing home is, I think, 17 days, not 100, right? Because the Medicare is really interested in making sure that as soon as you don't need skilled care anymore, you're off, right? And the nursing homes don't want to challenge that because they don't want to get audited by the Medicare, by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So as soon as you're off Medicare, you're on private pay unless you qualify for MassHealth. Uh, Mass Health Medicaid is health insurance for the poor, not health insurance for the old. And so you got to show you're poor. So in this case, Mary, to qualify for Mass Health long term care benefits, and if she does qualify, she'll have to pay her Social Security check still, the $750 a month, to the nursing home, and then Mass Health will pay all the rest. For her to qualify, she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. Ah, but Frank can have a home as long as the equity in the home is less than, I get this figure wrong, it was $817,000. It just went up a little bit, but it's around there. He can have cash or cash equivalent assets. In addition to that, up to $119,220. That's the correct current number. Don't ask me where that comes from. It just comes from the sky. It's a federal number. Um, and in addition to that, and most importantly, and by the way, if, you know, if you're, fr you're from out of state or you know people from out of state, these rules vary a lot from state to state. Massachusetts has probably the most generous rules in the country, right? So it, it may be that these don't work in New York, but if, but if you move to Massachusetts, even if you've lived in New York all your life, if you come to Massachusetts and go into a nursing home and you declare that day that it's your intention to stay here, you're now a Massachusetts resident. So these are the rules that would then apply, okay? So what Frank can do because he can have those assets and unlimited income, is if Mary's in the nursing home, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Mary transfer her interest in the house to Frank, and then she's gonna transfer all of her other assets to Frank. And by the way, we're assuming she can do that because even though she's incapacitated, she gave somebody a power of attorney. So somebody has the power to do these things. I've had cases where, the power, where somebody had a power of attorney but it didn't specify that the attorney had the ability to make gifts or to make gifts to him or herself, like the spouse. And as a result, we couldn't do any of this. It was terrible, terrible. Um, so then, now Frank has all the assets. So now what he has to do is he has to get, and his house is all safe, he has to get his cash below $119,220. Well, he can do that by simply buying an annuity. I never recommend the purchase of annuities as a, as, a, as a financial planning mechanism. I never recommend for them or against them. I'm not a financial planner. I don't get it. I can't figure out, I, can, I never understand. Those guys talk to me, I, I don't understand it, what they're talking about. But for this case, in this case, to get qualified for Mass Health, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. So Frank can basically take all the other, remember he has a house that's worth about 300 and cash of about 350, right? So he simply keeps about 100, takes the other 250, buys an annuity with it. As long as the annuity calls for regular monthly payments, equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a valid conversion from an asset to an income stream, and the day after he does it, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. And I say any amount. We've done, I've had cases where we've bought annuities for over a million dollars. And the spouse ends up getting these gigantic monthly checks. By the way, if you're 80, your life expectancy actuarial is about eight years now. If you're 87, your actuarial, the, the kind of cutoff right now for this availability of this is 88, I think. Um, because, simply because the annuity companies right now won't sell you an annuity for less than five years. And at that age, your life expectancy goes below five years. So, what does Frank have to do? 
Uh, so the one other thing that Frank might want to do in that case, either before or after Mary is on Mass Health, is change his will. Because you remember his will at the beginning, we said his basic plan was whether he had a will or not, I want everything to go to Mary. And then when she dies, I want everything to go divide up among the kids. Well, of course, if he now dies and Mary's in the nursing home and he gives everything to her, now she's got a big problem, right? Because now she's got $650,000 in assets, which means all the cash has to be spent down. The house doesn't because the house is not a countable asset. But at that point, MassHealth will put a lien on that house to collect the money after she dies, right? So what Frank wants to do instead is to have a will that says, when I die, I'm leaving everything in trust for my wife. And I'm going to name as my trustees Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., or any one of them, right? And, they, and I'm going to give them complete discretion to make any distributions they want to my wife. But if I've done that, then the day after I die, all those assets are immediately safe. And my wife can stay in Mass Health, and there'll be all this money available to supplement her care. And after she dies, the money's going to get divided up among the kids. Now, in, I know in the back of your mind, you keep saying, but what about that five-year look-back rule? There is no look back rule. There is no look back regarding transfers between spouses, which is why the whole transfer from Frank to Mary works. And there's nothing regarding uh, having a testamentary trust for the benefit of another person, including your spouse. Even though the even though the funds had just been transferred to Frank, they get transferred to Frank on day one, and he writes that new will and dies on day two. Uh, and all the assets are in his name when he dies for her, with the, her, for, in trust for her benefit. Everything is safe. Okay? So, with that in mind, with that in mind, Frank and Mary really don't need to do any real advanced planning in terms of dealing with nursing home care. Right? As long as they're both alive. The one thing they should do is change their wills so that if one of them dies, everything is going to go in trust for the benefit of the other. And then make sure if one of them gets sick, that you stack all of the assets in that person's name so that when one of them dies, it all gets saved for the benefit of the other. Now, the only problem is if Frank has died and hasn't done that, right, and Mary is now single, I often have this. People come in, oh, my spouse just died. Now I want to see if I can do some asset protection because I'm worried about the nursing home issues. And I'll tell them, well, you know, now it gets a lot harder because uh, now you've got these assets, um, but in order for you to save any of them, you have to give them away. You just have to literally give them away. You have to, you have to gift things. Um, you, can't, you, you don't have to create trust or anything if you don't want to. You can just give them to your children. Now, obviously, that involves some trust, right? That if you really need them, you're going to still have them. But, but one kind of compromise as far as the house is concerned is you can gift your child the house. And, off, and for most people, and definitely in Nantucket, the big asset is the house, right? So you can gift your child the house or your children the house and simply keep a life estate in it. A life estate is all of the rights that you could have in that house until you die. Complete control over the house. So you, and it's complete responsibilities. You still have to pay the taxes and the insurance and all that jazz, right? And you still get your elderly exemption, right? Um, and any other exemption, your, your veteran's exemption, whatever you're entitled to, right? And, and, and no one can throw you out. And if you want to rent it, you can. But all of your interests die with you. They end at your death. And, is, and, and what you're giving your children is all the remainder, the remainder of the rights in the house, the right to live there after you die, and the right to do all those other things. And that's why their interest is called a remainder interest. If you do that, then five years after you've done this and kept your life estate, if you need nursing home care, the house is not going to be counted. The remainder interest is not counted because it got gave, given away more than five years ago. The life estate is, the life estate isn't counted because it was your residence. MassHealth will put a lien on your life estate. So you don't want to sell the house while you're alive, but you know, you're in the nursing home, so the kids just have to suck it up, you know, and rent the house out or whatever until you die. But when you die, at the moment of your death, your life estate evaporates, and so does the Mass Health lien. And so when the kids go to sell it, they can sell it lien free, right? So that's a common way of dealing with that. The only disadvantage to this is that if you, if instead of going to the nursing home, you really want to sell the house because you want to, you know, go to assisted living or you just want to shrink down or whatever. In that case, the, the, the capital gains exemption that you have because you have been the resident of the house for two of the last five years, 
only will apply to the life estate portion of those sales proceeds. And so you may end up paying more of a capital gains tax as a result of the sale of the house. That gets a little more complicated than I want to do today. But so there's an issue. In, if you're concerned about that, that's the case in which you create an irrevocable trust. You name one of the kids as the trustee. You transfer the house to the irrevocable trust. But you do the same thing. You transfer the remainder interest. You keep the life estate. Regarding anything else, uh, don't transfer funds to an irrevocable trust. Bad idea. Bad, bad idea. Mass Health is increasingly challenging these when they've got cash in them based on the premise that the trustee, even if it's your kids, probably has the ability to, con a lot, these trusts typically say that you're entitled to the income, but that the trust gets all the keeps all the principal. And Mass Health is increasingly saying, no, there's always a way through which you can take that principal and turn it into an income stream, like by buying an annuity which legally is considered to just be an income stream. And therefore, they've been deeming funds that are in these irre irrevocable trusts to be countable. Instead, what you really need to do is you need to just gift the money to your kids, right? Ideally, have them set up a trust once it's in their names, naming themselves as beneficiaries so that if you need the money, you have to go through this circuitous thing. You tell the kids who is the trustee of the trust, I really need $50,000, and the child distributes it to themselves and then distributes it back to you. Now, none of those transactions, by the way, is taxable. There is no gift tax. There is this, well, unless you've got a lot of money, there is no gift tax. People always know about this. Well, you know, isn't there something bad that happens if I give somebody more than like $10,000 in a year or 14? There's like this number that they all have in their minds. That's a completely irrelevant number unless your estate is worth less or more than $5.4 million dollars. Or if you're married, unless your estate between you and your husband is worth more than $10.8 million. Other than that, there is no gift tax, right? Once that, that gets more complicated, but, so, but I'm just telling you that. So that's the way that you would handle that. Don't do irrevocable, irrevocable trusts. We talked about the house. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, a couple of words about long-term care insurance, because as people are getting older and before they're 70, because usually after 70, you can't no longer qualify for long-term care insurance. Uh, people will say, well, why sh shouldn't I buy long-term care insurance? And the answer is, well, yeah, maybe, except that if you're Frank and Mary, as we've just discussed, you really don't need it, right? Because if you're in the nursing home and one of you goes to the nursing home, you can just shift everything to the other spouse. And if the other spouse dies, you put everything in trust for the benefit. And so you don't need it, right? Unless you're both going to the nursing home. Uh, I've been practicing for 38 happy years. And during that time, I've had that happen twice. The two people went to the nursing home. Both cases, they were in their not both in their 90s, and in both cases, nobody lived more than two years in the nursing home because at that point, you know, it's just the chances are small. So it's certainly it's a risk that you take, and if you really are nervous about it, then you should insure against it. But it's a small risk. <clears throat> Ironically, the only time that you might want to think about long-term care insurance is not for the nursing home, but these policies now often have a home care provide, proviso that you can, in addition to using your, applying your, so they typically give you so many days worth of care at a figure, like $150 a day or $200 a day. Often now you can apply that to home care. And while there is a mass health program that will pay for your home care, I didn't talk about that one today because that just, I might do that this fall. This gets more detailed. Um, you may want to have this policy so that you can supplement that care because typically Mass Health, if you are, if Mary were eligible for a nursing home, Mass Health would also pay the cost of home care to keep her at home, but typically not more than 40 to 50 hours a week. Yes, you heard that right. 40, they'll actually pay. Mass Health will pay 40 to 50 hours a week of home care if you can show that otherwise the person would be going to a nursing home. But 40 to 50 hours for some of these folks isn't going to do it. Right, because there's more hours than that in a week, right? And the and the long-term care insurance policy may allow you to get you the number of hours that you need, even if you're there living with them, so that at least you have maybe you're there at night, but you want you always want coverage during the day. The other thing about the the long-term care insurance policies is they give you more flexibility in terms of who you're picking as your home care provider, because for mass health purposes, there's a designated list of home care providers, right? And they may be very limited, but Things to think about regarding if you're buying a policy. These policies, there's no standard policy, right? So things like when are you sick, and therefore when you can use the policy, is going to vary from policy to policy. For example, in many of the policies, at least in the old days, like in all of them, 
They said in order to qualify for this benefit, at, if, even for the home care, you need to show that you need assistance with at least one of the activities of daily living. You'd say to yourself, aren't all activities of living activities? Well, no, there are five kind of official activities of daily living that we all agree are the real activities of daily living. Dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, transferring. Transferring, what does that mean? It means getting out of a chair, walking across a room, sitting down. The old policies would say, unless you need physical assistance with one of those, you, the policy doesn't kick in. Well, that's problematic if you've got an Alzheimer's situation because your, your spouse or whatever may still be able to do those five things. Just they're real confused about them, <laughs> that's all. So in that case, the policy won't kick in. So that's gonna vary from policy to policy. You wanna know whether um, you, in order to do this, you have to hire a certified agency. The reason why this is of some significance in Massachusetts is that Massachusetts doesn't certify agencies. There is no list of certified agencies. So there's often a question in Massachusetts as to whether they'll pay anybody. Um, in addition, you, you wanna, you'll wanna find out if they're really, really limited in that you might have some particular people in mind that you really want to have taking care of somebody. And you want to see if the policy is going to cover them. Uh, and are you allowed to make extra payments to these people? One of the questions that often comes up with these policies is there'll be an amount that can be paid every day, like, oh, $150 or $100. But, uh, but many times home care providers will get, or agencies will get paid $25 or $30 an hour. So that might not buy you more than three or four hours. So the question is, can you hire that same person or agency to do more hours, right? Some policies don't let you do that, right? So you want to know about that. Estate tax avoidance, completely different topic, not relevant to everybody, any place except in Nantucket, right? Because the issue is, while, while for federal purposes, you, there is no estate tax unless if you're an individual, you have an estate which is now more than I always get the numbers mixed up because it goes up with inflation, but I think it's like $5.4 million now. And if you're a couple and you don't use your exemption because you give everything to your spouse and use the marital exemption instead, that your spouse then has your exemption too. So your spouse's exemption is then $10.8 million. So even on Nantucket, that gets a lot of people out. The Massachusetts system, though, taxes all the states over $1 million. And the initial rate on the first dollar over a $1 million is 40%. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's pretty staggering, isn't it? Now, for, for, for bizarre historical reasons, it doesn't stay 40% for long. It only is 40% for about the first $100,000. So if you have a million dollar estate, your estate tax is zero. If you have a estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars your estate tax is about $40,000, 40% of that first hundred. The tax on the next $100,000 after that is like 7%. So the tax on the next $100,000 is like $7,000, right? So the, your big hit is that kind of very early tax, but after that, the tax gets much lower, right? So if you have an estate that's, if you have a total estate, including your house, that's worth less than $2 million, you can avoid the estate tax entirely by doing some planning. But in theory, what you need to do, the concept behind this is, if you, if Frank, you're Frank and Mary, and Frank dies and leaves everything to Mary, well, there's 100% marital deduction, so there's no tax there. But at that point, Frank has basically given away, well, he's dead, but his estate has given away the ability that he had to give away a million dollars tax-free, because now Mary has an estate worth $2 million. And when she dies, the whole thing's gonna get taxed. So the trick is, and it's a standard trick, they're, they're called, um, uh, often referred to as AB trusts. You, you set up Frank's will, you make sure that Frank has a million dollars in assets when he dies. And you set up his will to say, instead of the asset going to Mary, it's gonna go in trust for Mary's benefit. Now for estate tax purposes, as opposed to for, uh, for uh, mass health purposes, these trusts can be very liberal. Like Mary can be the trustee and can distribute stuff to herself. But as long as you structure it correctly for government purposes, that first million dollars when Frank dies was part of his estate, never becomes part of Mary's estate, and therefore if she dies the next day leaving the other million dollars, because their estate was two million dollars, there's no tax, right? So I'm just telling you, you can, play, you, can, you can successfully play that game, and even if the total estate is worth more than that, you can still derive an estate tax benefit, but it gets too complicated to discuss in Elder Law 101. Um, the main thing, and, and you can combine some of this, some of these trustee, the, these trusts, with asset protection trusts on, in various situations. The thing, the thing to remember though is 
The goal of life back when we were dealing with federal estate tax avoidance was always federal estate tax avoidance because the rate was so high. The rates went up to 55, 60 percent in the tax rates. The Massachusetts tax after that first 100,000 is like this small tax. For most people in Nantucket, the big issue is the capital gains tax, right? You bought your house in the early 90s for like $300,000 and now it's worth $2 million. So you sell the house your tax is going to be, your capital gain is the difference between what you bought it for, $300,000, and $2 million, or $1.7 million. The maximum, Mass, the, Massachusetts, the maximum capital gains tax rate right now is 28.3%. So the tax on 28.3% 20, on a uh, $1,700,000 is about $450,000 in tax. This is a big number. Now, if you die owning that house, Instead of, now there's other parts about the, the home exemption and all that jazz, I'm not gonna go through that. But if you die owning that house and your kids inherit it, what happens at the moment of your death because it goes through your estate, or if it goes through your estate, is the basis in that house, the, ba the, the amount, I should, oh, I'm gonna step back one thing. What a capital gains tax is, a, a capital gain is the difference between basis and sale price. Basis is typically purchase price. So it's typically the difference between purchase price and sales price. If you die owning a piece of property and it's part of your estate at its full value, the result of that is that for capital gains tax purposes, the basis jumps to the date of death value. So in this case, if you bought a house worth th for $300,000 and you die owning it and it's worth $2 million and your kids sell it the next day, the basis in that property is $2 million. And if they sell it for $2 million, they pay zero in capital gains tax. Zero, right? So in, the, in my example, how much did you save? About $400,000, right? Now, remember, if that, if that was the only asset in the estate, right? And you had, so you had a $2 million estate, that means that when the second spouse died, there was, a cap, there was an estate tax, right? But how much is the estate tax on that estate? About $100,000, right? About $100,000. So. So your, your, I think that's right, approximately, right? So you, so in order to, so by avoiding the estate tax by doing all this other stuff, right? And, there, and not allowing this house to jump in value because of the step up in basis, you may be killing yourself for capital gains tax purposes. The message of all of this is you gotta talk to somebody about this. You gotta talk to, this is really important here because this is just, there isn't one right answer to this, it's just a math problem. But you got to so talk to somebody that knows the equation and can do the math problem for you. Uh, avoiding probate. Avoiding probate, um, many people, will, when they come in, ask me if they, can, they really want to do this. And you don't do that by doing a will, by the way. Because whether you have a will or not, if you die owning assets in your name at the time of your death, just your name, they're going to go through probate. The only difference between having a will and not having one is if you don't have one, the state's written a will for you. It's called the rules of intestacy. I talked to you about the fact that in Frank's and Mary's case, it is everything goes to the spouse and otherwise goes to the kids, right? And you, and you still have to go through probate and all that jazz. So the question is, can you structure your assets so that you don't own anything at the moment of your death? You can, through joint, joint ownership. Remember, Frank and Mary owned their house jointly, so when one of them died, their interest simply evaporated, the other one became the sole owner. You can do that with all of your assets. And when Frank has died, Mary could do that with those assets by naming her children as joint owners, right? There may be some reasons to do that. There may be some reasons not, but you can definitely avoid probate doing that. The other way to do that is using a revocable trust. Typically, you, Frank and Mary would take the house and say, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a revocable and amendable trust. I'm going to keep complete control over this trust, right? And the two of us are going to be the co-trustees, and we're going to be able to amend it, do whatever we want at any time. We're going to have so much control that for government purposes, it's still, for tax purposes, it's still ours. These are called grantor taxable trusts, right? You don't even have to file a separate tax return or a tax ID number, right? The only thing about them is that when the two of them have died, you, what they would do is they'd name the person who was going to be the administrator of their will or the personal representative, they'd name them as the, co the successor trustee. And they'd say, okay, you the successor trustee, you take care of everything. And what you've done by doing that is you've kept the asset from needing to go through probate and you've allowed that successor trustee to immediately take possession of the assets and divide them all up. Finally, personal property. By that I mean tangible personal property, not bank accounts. The stuff around the house. 
including though the car. <clears throat> Technically, those assets too have to go through probate. But except for the car, which you might want to handle through joint ownership, except for the car, they never really do go through probate. Because if you die and the kids are just going around the house, they're just going to divide up the assets, right? They're just going to figure it out, right? So you really kind of don't need a will for that, right? Except you, what you may want to do is have a will that is really designed so that it'll never have to be used. Because first of all, in your will you say, regarding my tangible personal property, right? Which may have some things that are of value and which may have some things that some of your kids, more than one of them wants, right? You just say in your will, I'm gonna, if I do a list of who gets what, then everybody has to abide by that list. That's actually legally enforceable if you have that in your will and if you've done the list, of course, right? Or you say in your will, I want everything to be divided equally among my kids, and if the kids can't agree, the personal representative decides, right? Well, if you have that will and you die, and there's, all, and there's this personal property and the kids start fighting about it, right? Now they've got two choices. They can either figure it out, right, and using the instructions in the will, because you explained how it was supposed to happen, right? And they just do it that way, or they can file a probate wait a year, spend $10,000 in attorney's fees, and then do the very same thing. So which one would you do? Of course, you just divide it up. Same thing for this, this is the final item, is, is it joint, joint accounts. Oftentimes, people avoid, avoid probate, as I had mentioned, by putting other people's names on the accounts. The singest, single biggest cause of will contests in the probate courts is the fight between the personal representative, the executor of the will, and the surviving joint owner, typically of a big bank account, right? Because the, the, the personal representative says, Aunt so-and-so never really meant that money to go to you. You were just do, you were helping her out. She was just doing that as a convenience. And then the, the niece, who was the niece that was the favorite niece, was saying, oh, no. You know, Aunt so-and-so, you know, I was helping her out. Aunt so-and-so told me I could have that money because I was helping her out, right? That fight gets done regularly in probate court. Now in that city, and I've had that fight, I've watched that fight, I've watched, I've watched siblings spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in a fight like that because the accounts were a million, you know, and so they fought. And as I've said, in those cases, aunt so-and-so either wanted the person who was the surviving joint tenant to own that account, or she didn't. What she de definitely did not want though was that all this money was gonna get spent on lawyers, right? So the way you avoid that is you have a will, and in your will you say either, it is my intention that the surviving joint tenants of any bank accounts I have, or of this specific bank account, are really gonna get the money, right? Or, it's my intention that any joint accounts I have are really part, to be part of my estate when I die. And now you've clarified the problem. So now you die, and the surviving joint tenant gets these accounts, and there's this will. But the will says what's supposed to happen. It's the same thing as the personal property. Now you got a choice. You can either divide it up the way the will says, or you can go through probate, spend $10,000 on lawyers, wait a year to see if any creditors file a claim, and then divide it up the way the will says. So which one are you going to do, right? So you have a will, and the purpose is to avoid probate. Finally, uh, if there was, we just went through a lot of information. If you were just dying, because, and you, or you fell asleep a half an hour ago, you can always watch this. On you, on, we have a YouTube, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary, and you can watch it there, or it, it very kindly, Nantucket Cable TV rebroadcasts this so you can pick it up on Nantucket Cable TV. Uh, the goal of all of this stuff is to sleep well at night. I hope that this has been helpful. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. We're going to take questions. Well, I promised it was going to be 15 minutes of questions. I'm going to stay here as long as you need to, though, afterwards. I, don't, I just don't want to hold people up. Yes, ma'am. Um, going back to your estate tax avoidance for a moment, yep. if there's not a house, and we're talking about um, just bank accounts and mutual funds and things like this, um, two questions there. Um, you're saying, you were, when you were talking about the mass health thing, is this the same trust you're talking about? What kind of trust are you talking about? If the kids took out a trust for the, 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 the parent benefit, if we, are, it, so I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. If this is a mass health question. Well, there's, I, I'm saying, is it the same trust? No, is okay. it the same trust? No. Well, you talked no. about, you talked there, about this same thing in two, in two di different that's scenarios. That's right, that's right, that's right. If you were, if the, if the, if the, if the goal of the exercise is, is estate tax avoidance, yes. 
then either through a standalone trust or through the will, which has a trust in it, you can provide that, the, that funds would get that would have otherwise gone to the surviving spouse will get held in trust for the benefit of that surviving spouse. In that case, the surviving spouse herself or himself can be a trustee. Um, and, and by doing that, you can, you can protect that money. If, if there's, if, and if there's no surviving spouse, you'd say in the trust that everything gets divided up among the kids. You'd say, right, that was, that's always kind of the automatic alternative, right? But that, that, can be part of, that can be part of a will or it can be part of a standalone trust. There are a lot of options for the estate tax avoidance. If, if, and, and all of that becomes irrevocable when the trust kicks in. When that, when that first person dies, those rules become irrevocable, but not until then. Similarly, with the Frank and Mary asset protection provisions in the will, they, they'll each have a will that says, when I die, everything is going to go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. In that case, if it's, if it's asset protection that you want for mass health purposes, the trustee cannot be the spouse. The trustee would have to be one of the kids. Um, and that becomes irrevo irrevocable only when that spouse dies, when the first spouse dies. So you, re you retain complete control of all of your assets until the first spouse dies. I hope that answers your question. I'm glad to do something more specific afterwards. Um, I think there was a question there and then over here. Yes, sir. Then you, sir. Then you, ma'am. And then, then I think I'm done. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. What does MOLST stand for? MOLST stands for Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Okay. okay. And I practiced that before I came. I've, I've blown that question before. Yeah. Do not hospitalize. Yes. And, and, and they're going to leave you on the floor or they'll bring you into the bedroom. Yeah, but they won't take you to the hospital. They won't take you to the hospital unless your health care proxy overrules you. So you want to make sure that he or she is also on board. Very important. To me, the most important part of the most form. Do not hospitalize. Uh, yes, sir. And then you, ma'am. Yes, sir. We want this to be a theoretical question. Suppose you had turned over your house to your child last year, right? We don't want it to be too specific here. Yeah. You're correct. Oh, it's four, it's gone up. No longer. So the que so the, so the example is if you if you gave your house to a child, um, and continued to live there, and then and then you needed to go and qualify for Mass Health, could a lien be placed on your house? And the answer is, if you transferred it to your child, and the transfer was at least five years old, and you kept a life estate in the property so that you continue to re be responsible for the taxes and everything else, right? Then I think at the end of that five years, if you, one of you needed nursing home care, a lien would be put on your life estate, but following your death, the lien will evaporate, so it would be as if it was lien free. If you've transferred the house to your child but not kept a life estate, right, and you're still living there and you're not paying rent to the child, then I think you could have a problem. Because I think Mass Health could then say, well, you didn't really transfer that house to your child because you're living there, rent you're still living in the house. So it would be a lot better if he had a life estate. The other reason why you'd want to keep a life estate is if you just transferred the house to your child, then when you did that, you gave him your tax basis in the property. So whatever you paid for that property, that's now his tax basis. If he sells that house, whether before or after you die, he will pay a capital gains tax on the difference between what you paid for that property and what it's worth right now. I bet there's a big difference, a big difference. Whereas, if you transferred him the property, a remainder interest, but kept a life estate in the property so that you could live there until you die, when you die, that basis jumps to the date of death value and your child doesn't have to pay any capital gains tax. So you may want to do some reshuffling there based on what you told me. All right. Uh, there was a question. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. And the you. Um, yes. Well, he, you answered. The question was similar to what he has. 
Yeah. It is my experience that currently folks over 70 are going to have a lot of trouble qualifying. Okay, so you should be under 70. You need, you typically, yes. That, that's, that was different in the old days. And that's the reason why so many of the premiums on so many of these old policies have gone up so much. Because they screwed it. They didn't figure out their actuarial tables right. And they're, they're dying. The insurance companies are getting killed, right? So now they're getting much tighter on this. And among other things, if you're over 70, it's very unlikely you'll qualify. Yes, yes ma'am. If there, are, if, there is, if there are simply assets, and this, this is for probate avoidance purposes, if that's the issue, then if there are simply assets, most assets you're, you can put a, a, a so-called POD or a TOD, transfer on death or pay on death to somebody. And the effect of that is that it just instantly goes to them. It's the same thing as having a life insurance policy and the you name the beneficiaries. It's not yours when you die. And so there's no probate necessary. So usually that avoids it. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I should do this last one. Yes, sir. That's why I'm talking fast, and I'm glad to stay afterwards. Yes? If you have your children named in any kind of uh, structure, yep. or, and one of their children gets sued for a big amount of money, what liability is there against the structure? So if you've transferred an interest to one of your kids and then that child gets sued, how could that be bad? That can be really bad. That is another reason why in some cases, folks will put stuff into trust for the benefit of the kids following your death as opposed to simply transferring it to them. I'm actually, I got a call, I'm talking to somebody about that on Monday where there was a transfer of interest to uh, children and in this case, one of the kids is getting a divorce. What happens now? Well, you know, there could be a problem, <laughs> right? Right, because that, because the, while, the, while the court cannot count that asset in terms of, as part of a kind of a 50-50 distribution. And, and, and I, we are, there are three people in our office that just do divorce, I don't do divorce. But they, I am told that the interesting thing about the Massachusetts divorce rules is things on the property division have to be equitable, not equal. Equitable, not equal. So the judge can take into account other assets of a person in figuring out whether things should be 50-50 or 45-55, et cetera, right? And that's the kind of thing they could take into account. Thank you very much. And I hope you come to Elder Law 102, which will be all about benefits. And it's going to be in June. Thank you.